Okay, looks like we're almost at that time. Let's see if I get the chat box working. Okay. Mary Kay, I'm assuming that you are you are on, and I'm going to get started here. Looks like you are. And hopefully you can see the screen. Can you just uh, confirm that you're good to go and you can see the screen, Mary Kay? I see that we have two attendees and one viewer. So one is you, one is me. And I believe you're the only one who signed up. Okay, great. All right, so hopefully you'll enjoy this um, presentation today. This is really an area I've been working in for uh, years. And um, when I say years, literally uh, going on uh, eight and a half years of just doing suicide prevention. <laughs> so just as a reminder, Mary Kay, um, if you, um, to get bounced out or if the, if the screen freezes for whatever reason, just go back to the link that got you on in the first place and click on that and it should take you right back in. It shouldn't take more than uh, 20 or 20 seconds or so. Um, so again, I'm doing this every Monday. Um, I did send you the course evaluation and the uh, worksheet uh, showing evidence of participation and learning. Um, and I'll send those uh, certificate out to you again within you know a few days like last time. And again, just a reminder for if you want to give people credit for referring you, Mary Kay, in this case, if you put their name on your email to me, I will give them credit. And after every five sessions, they will get a free webinar. Uh, and uh, same for you. If you're referring people, I appreciate it because I'm having a hard time getting the word out, but I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to keep coming back. And I know this is going to take a while to get rolling. Um, also, you had asked about uh, doing a webinar. I'm more than happy to do that for you. I can set that up. I, as a New York State provider, um, I'm permitted to set up new trainings too. So if you want something more extensive around suicide prevention or whatever topic, um, I'd be happy to, to help with that. Um, uh, my background, as you know, uh, I went to Lemoyne College up here in Syracuse. I did get a SAMHSA dissertation grant to do my dissertation that was on adolescence actually. Uh, and adolescent treatment practices. That's a different presentation altogether. I'm also a geriatric uh, social work scholar, work with the Hartford uh, faculty program. Um, I worked for New York State Oasis for six and a half years. Also um, worked in the managed care uh, uh, area for uh, several years as in referral line work, but also as working quality. And uh, did that level of care reviews. So I can, if you have questions about specific to that, I've uh, been with the VA, working with veterans for eight and a half years. I've taught at SUNY Albany. I'm also a part-time 
lecturer at the University of Southern California. And of course, I just started this uh, new online when this uh, Dr. Joe's uh, Learning Monday webinars. Um, the goals today are really to inform you about or refresh your knowledge of suicide risk conceptualization that will help shape your treatment goals to prevent suicide. So again, I will review what we talked about last time. Uh, learn components of an intervention designed to address, address specifically life, meaning, and purpose. And this is my own uh, intervention that I've been doing for about six years now. I uh, unfortunately have not been able to do the research on it yet, but I can tell you that it's um, very, very well received. Um, also, I'll talk today about how to just do a safe a suicide prevention safety plan. Um, uh, Mary Kay, if you would just take a minute and write down what you hope to gain from this webinar today, anything specific. I did update my case. I had a 43-year-old. I changed it to a uh, older gentleman uh, for our uh, exercise at the end of class. But if you have a specific um, goal for this, a learning goal, please uh, type it in there. And I know there's a delay, so I'll give you a minute to do that. And while you're doing that, I'll just give the disclaimers that although I'm an employee of both VA and USC, this presentation is done independently of those positions. The views expressed in this presentation are those of this author and do not necessarily reflect the opinion, position, or policy of the VA, the U.S. government, or USC. We talked about this briefly last time, dispelling myths. And um, that one of them is that there are talkers and there are doers. Okay. The safety plan, I don't want to overreact to a situation when to implement one. Okay, great. Um, uh, meaning with, and the thing we said about this is that people who are talking about suicide often uh, are doing it to work through the fear of uh, carrying out a suicide. They should be taken seriously. Um, the idea that there are doers, there's some truth to that, but um, oftentimes you can see the warning signs. That's, uh, and uh, certainly as clinicians, uh, we, we can have the ability to use some of those tools that I gave you to see uh, where someone's at and, and whether or not they may be at a great risk. Um, he wouldn't do that. He has young children. Uh, we're going to talk about the safety plan today and how, why and how that's so important as it relates to this. Again, this is a myth. Asking about suicide does not plant the seed, of course, and denying suicide does not equal no suicide risk. And if someone really wants to die, there is something we can do about it. And um, just because someone was drunk when they engage in act of uh, suicide, uh, self-directed violence, it doesn't mean that they won't actually take their life. One third to half of all suicides are alcohol involved. So the case we're going to talk about today is John. He's 78 years old and he lost his wife to multiple sclerosis. It was a long process of slow decline until after decades she could no longer interact at all. Uh, he grieves the loss of not only his wife, but of the last 10 years of his life lost to providing her almost constant care. He is angry and lonely, fearing his own death is on the horizon. He has a bucket list of goals that he reports with regret have little chance of being accomplished. So this is going to be our case for today, and we'll have more detail uh, later on. Um, again, I like this model, and again, it helps us think about uh, the safety plan and, and intervention that many people are predisposed either through childhood trauma or even adult trauma um, or genetic predisposition. Um, and there's a vulnerability lying there. And then life stressors oftentimes kick in and create the uh, the mental illness or the problem that happens. Certainly this is true with suicide risk as well. Um, joiners, and this again, a little bit of a review from last week, Joiners Interpersonal Psychological Theory of Suicide Behavior, um, he makes the observations and, and, and uh, asserts that lethal self-injury is often associated with so much fear and pain that most will avoid it and not engage in it. However, one can develop the capacity to enact lethal self-injury. He talks about a habituated lack of fear of death, meaning they learn to not be scared of death anymore. Again, one of the ways people do that is by talking about it. Um, he also said, uh, posits that the desire to harm self is also necessary, and usually this is born out of perceived burdensomeness and failed belongingness. And so those are the two main pieces of Joyner's theory as it relates to um, interventions. Um, Self-preservation theory, of course, or, uh, is concerned with the, this idea that we've evolved to where we are now and that uh, Part of that evolution was our uh, inextricable um, relationship with our uh, social group, such that um, if we found our niche and had something unique of ourselves to offer, that that would give us a, a social survival advantage. It would give us the, the ability to be part of groups where you know many hands make light work, there's strength in numbers and so forth. 
And so the theory talks about this idea that we evolved to that, but then when our brains uh, evolved over the last 10,000 years or so, it really changed our behavior and our ways of uh, our self-directed um, um, uh, decisions and goal-directed decisions. And um, so, but the, our sense of purpose was defined by this relationship with our social group of, of concern. And when we utilize our strengths according to our passions, meaning the groups that we cared about, uh, that that gave us a sense of purpose. It also gave us um, our identity. And um, the idea here is that people who are suicidal almost always lose this sense of meaning and purpose in life. And by focusing on that, and this is what we're going to talk about today, we can help individuals realign life pursuits to establish a sense of meaning and purpose by helping them bring their strengths and passions together. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. I wanted to remind you also of this um, uh, picture, uh, which is a, an advanced organizer that helps us think about, um, you know, this, this suicide crisis. And again, this will relate back to when you do a safety plan. Because, first of all, you have the underlying in a fire, you have very dry wood. It has to be very dry in order to burn. You can't really tell by looking at it that it's dry. That's a good metaphor for this idea that people have social and emotional vulnerabilities. Um, and these are obviously very much linked to their mental illness. Um, uh, but they're also uh, not that visible necessarily to the human eye. Um, so uh, those vulnerabilities being things like uh, underlying shame and guilt, a sense of uh, feeling anxiety and dread, um, <clears throat> the, the social ones may be um, a lacking a sense of contribution, um, uh, having that lack of belongingness, um, a lack of social connectedness, <clears throat> you know, feeling ineffectual, like everything I do is one step up, two steps back. So all of those things can be, and it doesn't have to be all of them, there can be some combination of these uh, that are uh, right there and make someone very vulnerable. The oxygen in this equation is uh, extreme emotional dis distress, and I shared with you the patient status update report, which looks at the subjective burdens that someone's under, and they can kind of self-rate where they're at, but when they do that, and they have a lot of stressors, um, and, and there's an abs absence of adequate coping. In other words, they're uh, drinking or abusing drugs to cope. They are not seeking out help. They're not good at expressing their feelings. They don't reach out to their social system uh, or, or don't have a social system to reach out to, so they can't cope very well. So then these, these ingredients are very important. But the, the kicker is um, when really, and this is, this is the last piece that you would look at and think about for someone who might be a safety plan, when suicide is in their mind a real option for them, they think that they'd be better off if dead. They think others would be better off if they were dead. They um, oftentimes will tell you they have no fear of death or, or dying or suicide. I worked with someone today who um, uh, was an addict, who is an addict, and but he uh, basically was at desperate because he's out of drugs and he's out of money and he's very uncomfortable. He got kicked out of a detox, but his thing was. You know, he said, I would consider suicide, but I, you know, I don't want to shoot myself. I'm afraid I won't be successful. And, uh, you know, so he's someone who, although he has the fuel and the oxygen, he really doesn't, it's, the spark isn't really ready yet. And I, I think he, you know, he's not as risky as someone else I'd be worried about. He also doesn't have access to, to guns and, and isn't, hasn't, isn't really considering other strategies. So again, those things are a very much important part of this whole um, uh you know, uh, ignition that would have to come together, combustion that would have to come together to actually um, light, uh, uh, light up. So as I had said before, I think the best way to this is to look at subjective burdens. If people have a lot weighing on them, then to give consideration, is this someone who's worked through this idea of killing him or herself? And uh, if so, do they have poor coping skills? And then what are those underlying vulnerabilities that may be ever present and just driving this person Two, um, you know, towards suicide, where they're in their mind, suicide may be the only option out of their situation. And again, we talked today about um, the, you know, the ideas around suicide uh, on the risk side. Somebody has a capacity, uh, meaning they have a lack of fear of death. They have that death ideation preparation. Um, they have the means and the motive in the moment, right? And they have. Um, the, the drivers of it, whether it's burdensomeness or lack of belongingness or lack of contribution or feeling ineffectual, those are all in place. And 
your safety plan is going to really focus on these things, on the risk side. Whereas I'm going to share with you an intervention that focuses on the protection side, where the focus is on connection with others. Uh, it's, it's where in the center of that is building back meaning and purpose by helping the individual identify their capacities to affect positive difference, to find life roles and service to others or cause that's important to them. And I'm going to give examples of that today. And, and make those connections with people who care and appreciate what they're doing. So again, if you go back to that metaphor where you know, I'm the hunter, I bring in the buffalo, and I um, see, the, see the people eating, I see that they're enjoying the food, and I'm welcomed, and I feel belonging, and I have a sense of purpose. That's kind of the, the dynamic that we're looking for for recovery, for helping someone through their suicide crisis. And I think that gets much more challenging when you think about uh, working with seniors in many, in many ways, although the rewards are that much greater as well. Um, the review of the suicide risks assessment tips, again, you wanna, when you're reviewing suicide risks, you want to move to remote from remote to recent events. Check in on subjective experience. Be conservative and err on the side of caution. Some clinicians say, oh, I think they know it all, and they're, oh, they're never doing anything, blah, blah, blah. I, I really don't believe in that kind of thinking. Even when I'm pretty sure somebody's all right, I would never say something like that. Um, avoid reliance on suicide ideation alone. Remember, method matters. If someone tried a gun or, or uh, rope in the past, much more likely to succeed. Always address guns, especially in the safety plan. Consider risk associated with those five domains we just talked about. Seek consultation when in doubt. I think this is really important. Um, I've seen this happen a lot of times with clinicians who were working with a patient for a long time, and they just, I think they just start naturally making assumptions about how they're doing, and uh, then can become somewhat blinded. So I think, you know, it's the, the patient status update report helps with that, but also seeking consultation um, and getting that clinical supervision is critical. Uh, whenever there's a co-occurring mental health and alcohol or substance use disorder, that the, everything, the risks of everything go up. Um, and always, I would say with, with suicide risk, again, don't be afraid to go with your gut. So going back to Joiner, in terms of treatment now, we're, we're transitioning from the assessment to treatment. Um, he would say that people get better as a result of building the therapeutic alliance. And it, be, it that in and of itself, that therapeutic relationship becomes a source of belongingness. And he would say you would use cognitive and behavioral interventions to address perceived burdensomeness and that lack of belongingness. Okay, so what are those automatic thoughts that drive someone to feel that way uh, and then help them think more realistically through that? So the aims are to develop the therapeutic relationship as a source of health care and support. So clinical approaches highlight developing the and, and strengthening that therapeutic relationship. And then treatment aims also foster a sense of belongingness through and, and then challenging the validity of cognitions that support their, their sense of burdensomeness and lack of belongingness, like I said. So that's basically, it's a CBT approach to um, dealing with someone who's at risk for suicide. Now, self-preservation therapy, which falls, follows from self-preservation theory, um, is, is somewhat similar, but in quite different in some ways as well. The intervention that I've been doing, and I've been doing as an inpatient to outpatient intervention is called SIMPLE. Uh, SIMPLE stands for um, building on strengths according to interests to develop meaning and purpose in life experiences. And basically it's growing back the passion to live. And that's the focus of the SIMPLE intervention. The mechanism of change then, per, according to, to self-preservation theory, is that when you help someone pursue their passions and what they really care about, utilizing their strengths, um, and the simple intervention is helping them do this, that that's then going to decrease their suicide risk. And that's, so that's really the mechanism of change. The aims of this intervention are to decrease one's level of suicide ideation, hopelessness, uh, depression, uh, likelihood and severity of any subsequent, subsequent suicide crises, and improve their overall subjective well-being. It also will help them increase social supports, empower them with tools for success. It increases their involvement in meaning-based activities and provides self-efficacy for safety planning and safety plan implementation. And I'll explain what that means in a minute. Establish a strong working alliance with the treatment provider and produces higher levels of, of treatment satisfaction. So these are the aims of the intervention itself. So how does it work? There is a very thorough review of strengths and the degree to which they've been used as still are, have been, still are, or could be utilized. Now, 
this, you know, when I do this training with large groups, it's funny how like clinicians uh, like the American might react having all, already a lot of good experience. They say, oh, we've been doing strengths-based assessments since we got our MSW, whatever. That's not what I'm talking about, though. I'm talking about a strengths assessment. Um, you know, most people, when they say that they're doing a strengths-based assessment, they might list one or two or three strengths, or maybe even four or five uh, for their patients if, if they're really focusing on strengths. But the truth is, most people have 10 to 15, and if you come up any shorter than that, you haven't really done a really good strengths assessment. And so I'll come back and talk about how we actually go about doing that. Then there's also a thorough exploration of interests and passions. What, what, is, what do they care about? What, what's important to them? Part of the intervention is to do the psychoeducation about this idea that bringing your strengths and passions together will help build meaning and purpose. And I actually um, have a diagram that, that shows this and kind of um, has like a, um, uh, what do you call that? A Richter scale for emotions and how, they, how things in life can set one off but if you're focused on meaning and purpose, you don't ignore those, those potential barriers, but you stay focused on, on those meaning-based goals and it can help pull you through. Uh, and so in that way, it becomes much more of a solution focus rather than a problem-focused um, intervention. Um, part of the process of the simple intervention is sets three to six months goal, six month goals that connect interests and passions uh, in, su in such a way that they're translated into simple daily tasks the patient can engage in and the trick is to have them develop as many as they can that would really pull them together and take up their time or, you know, if their work is such that, um, you know, when it could be something they do outside of work or try to make their work such that it works better for them in, in terms of how you're working with them. And again, I'll give you examples of those. Um, so it also, part of the intervention is, is to say, listen, there are barriers. And we can't ignore those, for example, alcoholism or depression uh, or uh, a relationship issue. So these all become potential barriers to blocking one's ability to grow meaning and purpose uh, and those meaning purpose-based activities. So we look at each of those barriers and think about problem solve. How, how do we deal with those? And one of the things that I've done with this intervention work is um, I had a small source of money, a small pot of money. And I bought things that veterans, or in this case it was veterans, typically like to have. Um, so for example, a pocket calendar to help their appointments or a, a nice sophisticated medication organizer to help. Uh, so I bought some of these and had them on hand. And when I say, you know, these things, nothing costs more than three or four dollars. Um, journals, for example. And they're not, not necessarily cheap looking, but when you buy them in bulk, you can get a pretty good price. And um, uh, what else? Um, Oh, and then also, so, and this is very powerful when you're working with someone and, and they love to write, for example, like, and I'm just thinking of someone I just worked with, loves to write poetry, right? And so I gave him a journal. And so now he's writing his poetry um, in that journal. Um, and uh, uh, the other piece of this is to give them some kind of symbolic object that can help them remember what their meaning-based goals are. And I've used a few things for this. Again, not really expensive, but I've gotten the, like challenge coins that have that have a message on it, like to thine own self be true. Um, and, uh, you know, other symbols on there that, you know, like a symbol of a compass and so forth, or a compass itself um, that, that can become a symbolic object or a little camping, you know, little, uh, uh, keychain camping lantern that actually lights up. And again, these are very powerful symbolic things that can help them remind them of what their passions are and their, and their meaning-based activities. Ultimately, with this intervention, I do a much more sophisticated safety plan than a typical one. It's, it's because it's the, the strategies in the safety plan are tailored to the warning signs. So there could be three warning signs with three completely different strategies. And they pull in the meaning-based activities, uh, those uh, utilizing those strengths and passions as a, a way to refocus uh, the individual on growing back that, that, that passion to live, so to speak, as we talked about earlier. So again, there's a strengths assessment, there's a passions assessment, and there's then you develop and expand the activities of meaning. So the strengths uh, questions would be things like, what are you good at? What are you good at at work? What are you good at 
uh, in your relationships with other people? Um, what would others say your strengths are? So for example, I like to ask the question, when you were a kid, what would your mom say or your dad say your strengths are or your friends? Um, in that particular job, what were you good at? What do people appreciate about you? Um, what's obvious from the session? This is always great. There's always a few, at least two or three strengths that you can say right from the session. Session. So, for example, you obviously care and you're very compassionate about other, you know, other people, or you have a great sense of humor, or you're a really good communicator, or you're obviously very organized. You know, so you start and what you do is you list these out. And you read it back to your patients several times as you're doing this. Uh, so those other things that might come up, you're intelligent, you're insightful. And then you ask them what unique skills or talents do you have? For example, some people are good with their hands. Some people are good at writing. Some people are very creative. <clears throat> and this really, this takes time. This isn't the kind of thing you want to spend five minutes with. You spend it, you can spend up to an hour on this. And, and you can come back to it. It doesn't have to be all done in one, one session. Um, and it doesn't have to be an hour either. You could spend 15, 20 minutes on it. And sometimes uh, those strengths come forward. Now think about this as, as you're working with someone who is um, depressed or anxious or down and out because of a bad marriage or lost job or a loss of housing. And you're focusing their, their thinking on their strengths. Just think about the impact of that. It's pulling them right out of their depression in a sense because they're now thinking of the positives and not the negatives. How can I get myself back on my feet in a way where my life has meaning and purpose again? And this is extremely powerful uh, when, when you're working with um, patients who are suicidal. The interests and passions are just as important as the strengths. You want to sit, stay with this, come up with as many as possible, um, things that you've done that were important to you, that you've loved to do, that were memorable, or things that you've always wanted to do. Um, you know, that you never got to do, or social pursuits, and this could be any number of things, uh, maybe hiking with friends, it could be uh, going to, uh, you know, a, a beach, you know, um, anything like that. Volunteering is huge. I always like to ask, have you ever volunteered? Have you ever thought about it? Um, because this is one of those things, that if they love volunteering, giving back to others, you find what their strengths are, what they're good at, and you find ways to bring those together. Um, organizational involvement. Again, this could be volunteer, but it also could be um, more formal job or work that they have, even if it's just part-time. Um, animals and pets. This is often one that people endorse and say, yeah, I love dogs or I love cats or some people say I hate cats or I love dogs <laughs> or whatever it is. Um, oftentimes, one of those passions, and this, again, makes sense in terms of the theory too, is their children or their grandchildren or other family members, or maybe a, a, a disabled sibling, for example. Um, what is it that was really important to you that you care about? Is there a particular group that you care about? Veterans, kids, um, uh, uh, seniors, um, uh, people who have uh, a particular disorder uh, because you had someone or you have that disorder, other people like you, or teenagers because you were a troubled teenager and you always want help. So again, very, very thorough kind of exploration of interests and passions. And again, this isn't something you do quickly. You know, take your time with this. Then the trick is, and this is where, this is kind of the fun part for the clinician, is how do you bring these together for this person? So for example, someone who's good with their, and all of these are real examples, by the way, someone who's good with their um, uh, hands and, and likes to do like woodworking type stuff, which is, could be relatively inexpensive if you already have the tools, um, and, and they really care about, in this case, uh, this, this individual cared about a nursing home that took really good care of his parents. He's going to build bird houses to bring to the nursing home and set up in the nursing home uh, as a way of saying thank you, but as a way of giving back, but also as a way of bringing his strengths and his, uh, his passion together in such a way that it's in service to others. Um, I worked with an individual who actually had a back problem, and he, and he wanted to do gardening, but he didn't think he'd be able to. I said, what about just growing tomato plants in the house and then sharing those with the neighbors? And he had talked about neighbors who, who had been very good to him and who's been friends with. How about sharing those with their neighbors, right? So these things are things that he could do or she could do on their own, uh, you know, in, in time, in idle time or in extra time 
that again using their strengths and bring them to and, and and the passions being you know the neighbors in the first case the nursing home in the second um, I just worked recently with someone who uh, was a painter and he's going to give his paintings to kids in uh, you know at a hospital uh, you know he's, he's good at drawing paintings of like cartoons and things like that and he's going to do those formal pictures and paintings and bring those to a hospital to a kids ward where um, that it'll be appreciated again so looking at that dynamic of um, you want to have an audience that's going to care about what you're doing so he's going to tailor what he's doing also to that audience but again it's, it's, you, you can't paint a picture overnight he's gonna spend time doing this he's gonna work really hard at it this hobby will give him a sense of purpose again and it's it's significant and meaningful um, another one, this is this is one that's come up in a couple different ways, but telling stories to my grandchildren. Um, and so that's good in and of itself, but you can also take any of these and really think about how can you enhance this. So one of the ways I helped him enhance this is I said, why don't you spend time outlining the story during the week and ask your grandkids to provide characters. So that way you talk to them more, say, who do you want in it? You outline the story. It becomes more sophisticated, but now... What you're doing here is you're helping the individual spend quality time doing things that, have, that build that meaning and purpose, even when he's not or she's not with those social people or the, that social group. Okay. So again, these are just a handful of examples where you're taking those strengths and your, those passions and you're bringing them together. Uh, and as I mentioned before, you're identifying barriers, engage in problem solving. But again, practice, uh, provide, excuse me, for the practical needs uh, to the extent possible. Uh, so again, all those things like a paper organizer or a journal. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of some other things, like the, the medication organizer. Um, I'm trying to think of what other things I have. I have like four or five different things that I use, um, that I purchase, that are inexpensive. And then, again, we want to focus on not only um, developing, coming up with some creative ways of developing them, but all, over time to maintain and build on those meaning-based activities to strengthen them in the ways that I had mentioned. Okay, so I know this is the part you're looking forward to, Mary Kay, I'm sure you found that interesting. But um, So um, suicide prevention safety plans are really um, – the alternative to what was old school, the, the safety contract. Um, the no harm contract or uh, safety contract really is not considered a viable strategy for suicide prevention. There really is no evidence to support the no harm contract. They rely very heavily on a patient's capacity to manage a suicide crisis, and that's not good. I'm going to come back to that point. They also falsely suggest that a clinician may be free from blame blamed for bad outcomes. So what am I talking about? A, say, a no harm contract is, what can, will you promise me that you won't hurt yourself between now and next week? That's the safety contract. It don't work. And so if you have someone who's at considerable risk for suicide, you really need to do a safety plan. So I'll go over what that is. And so the question I would ask, and, and this goes back to your question too, Mary Kay, is when do you do a safety plan? plan? Think about this, if somebody's at risk, does your high-risk patient have the skills and capacity to manage the suicide impulses that exist in a moment of crisis? I would say no. Um, often suicide attempts occur when a person's in a moment of crisis wherein they're distressed to the point of impaired judgment and poor impulse control, and then of course where there's access to means. And so a safety plan is designed to help someone deal with what they do, deal with their warning signs before they get to this point and give them some school, some skills and some tools to, to uh, avoid and avert the crisis. So again, in that moment of crisis, they're, they're distressed to the point where they really don't have the ability. And this is where you see things like, um, I can think of an example of this one uh, guy said, I would never um, do that to my children. He had like two girls that were like eight years old and he ended up engaging in what almost was a murder than a suicide um, and, a, and a rage. And he loved his family very much, but in that moment of crisis, people are not thinking clearly and uh, their judgment's impaired. And it's, you throw alcohol on there again, that's an accelerant. I mean, and in that case, I believe it was alcohol too. So 
again, um, this is the reason for a safety plan. Um, the safety plan first and foremost addresses environmental safety, okay? So this is access to guns especially because 50% of all suicides are by gun. And all other means tried or considered. This is important too because if someone's wrapped their mind around hanging or taking an overdose and, and um, that's probably what they're going to go to. So you want to consider all means tried or considered. You want to help them identify their warning signs that come before the crisis. So I had talked about this earlier, this idea of when you're reviewing suicide crises uh, with people, you want to start with the most remote and move to the most recent. And one of the reasons for doing that is it's more comfortable for them. But the other reason for doing it is you can start looking at parallels between those events and start to, to understand the pattern of behavior that plays out that leads to the uh, suicide crisis. So for example, someone's feeling desperate, then they start isolating, then they're feeling lonely, they're sitting in the dark, and then they start drinking, and then they become suicidal. So you see there's a lot of steps there before they become suicidal. So the idea is to identify those early warning signs and help them make sure they can identify and recognize those early warning signs in terms of thoughts. They may be automatic thoughts or um, those feelings those uh, that, that tend to play in. Maybe it's shame. Maybe it's uh, feeling like... Um, there's no sense in going on or they don't belong or they have no purpose, whatever it is, help them. And then you use that in your safety plan. So the, the, so after you adjust the safety, environmental safety, or at least that being one of the steps, the first, the, the first thing in terms of the sequential strategy is to help them identify those warning signs, again, going from most remote to most recent. Uh, and then they're going to develop, the safety plan will be a specific sequence of strategies to avert the crisis. Okay, so again, um, these could be things like they can do on their own that are, would be refocusing activities, as I gave an example. For example, if they have uh, their strengths and passions are the birdhouse guy, then, then maybe they're going to be building birdhouses, okay, uh, as something they can do on their own. And then maybe they're going to go visit the nursing home and put, put in a birdhouse um, as a social activity or being around other people. And if that's not working, then who will they reach out to? So this should include both informal and formal support. So you want to identify who are your friends, family members, or you know maybe it's a pastor, whoever, who you really feel you can trust and talk to. And so part of your safety plan is to identify those. So there's a sequence of behaviors. Usually the first is some kind of activity they can do on their own that's refocusing. Uh, if that's not working, then there's something more social-based, maybe going to the library to study up on um, you know birds, whatever it is. Uh, you know, whatever their interests are, but again, getting into a social place. And then the next is who can you reach out to, who you, who you care about, who you trust, who you would feel comfortable talking about this particular warning sign and set of issues with. All right. And again, this is now, remember I said this is long before they pick up the drink. And this is very important to keep in mind too, that if they're already drinking, they're not going to be rational anymore. We're trying to come up with a plan that can help somebody uh, long before they get to that point. And then the final piece of a safety plan is you should have the formal supports. It should be uh, your clinic, for example, or the crisis line, uh, the local uh, support line, um, and, and so forth. Maybe the doctor, um, especially with the Latino community. community uh, much, oftentimes, they're much more comfortable calling their medical doctor to talk about something like this. Put the medical doctor on there. Whoever those formal supports are, the chaplain like, could fall under a formal support as well, potentially. Um, so the process of safety planning is you do it along with your patient and, and you want to use his or her words. And sometimes if you have a more sophisticated patient, you can even have them write it themselves. Um, but you want to be honest, you want to demonstrate empathy, you want to normalize and validate the feelings and their experiences, convey hope. And again, is the extent you can link their strengths, interests, and passions. Um, and this is a this is a this is an awesome approach to take because oftentimes I just just I'm just thinking of someone I talked to earlier uh, earlier this week said to me suicide seems like my only option and this guy was extremely distraught over the loss of someone in his family and I I acknowledged that I said I understand suicide is seems like your only option here you're feeling very trapped and overwhelmed and it doesn't look like there's any other way to go I get that. 
But what I'm going to ask you to do today, and this is somebody who's on inpatient, is work with me to see if there may be other options besides the suicide option. And, and getting a commitment to live, to, tr to work on this for a while is important. And then, um, then, so th and then you got the safety plan, you're putting that in place, uh, becomes kind of their tool to help them be successful in that. Um, when you're doing a safety plan, each of those steps, you should evaluate the doability of the plan in light of the veteran's capacity or the individual's capacity and circumstances, and then modify the plan to accommodate their capacity, exercising good judgment with respect to environmental factors and social support. So in this case, I mentioned veterans, and I didn't have a posture there, but um, the other secret to good safety plan is involve those other people. If there is a spouse, if there is a best friend, if there is a brother, if there is a daughter, have them get involved with the patient's permission, get the release of information, and have them be part of the safety plan. Help Have them help evaluate the doability of the plan. Take that time to educate them about the warning signs uh, uh, that this veteran is, or this individual is experiencing. Uh, help them get their input about the realistic, how reasonable and realistic it is. Um, ask them how they could help and support in, in doing the safety plan. Now, again, you, not everybody will do this. Not every individual who's in need of a safety plan will say, yes, you can go ahead and call my brother John. They're, they're not all going to say that. But to the extent you can, that will, much, that will do a lot to strengthen your safety plan. The safety plan is not signed um, by your by your patient, it's given back to the patient though in a form that can be readily used. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is that risk assessment is ongoing and so should updates to the safety plan. So things change. Uh, they move to a new community, um, they go through a divorce, you know, um, those kinds of things, but they're still at elevated risk. Um, of course, we want to adjust the safety plan and modify it so it, it fits their uh, needs. And also it's important to keep in mind that it's not a substitute for a higher level, higher level of care or for psychopharmacological treatments uh, when there are indications for that. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to, I know we don't have a lot of time left because I'm gonna try to keep this to 50 minutes, but it's really important to talk about gun safety. And um, what I'll do is I will include uh, a, uh, these two slides in particular in an email back to Mary Kay the talk that, that you can use when you have a patient who's at risk who may have access to guns. And the message that you want to give is that the fact is guns are lethal. Um, whether it's due to an accident or other self-directed violence, um, you can't go back. You know, you can't undo it. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, when guns are used for violence, it often is an impulsive act, and again, it can't be undone. Therefore, the idea is create barriers to an impulsive act or an accident with a weapon as a strategy to prevent suicide, promote safety in the home. Um, so again, remind them that this idea that in a moment of crisis, suicide may seem like the best option. However, situations that drive suicide urges and intent are momentary and difficult situations do improve. And most people who attempt and live are very glad they're still alive. So again, this is the educational piece. And then this is the specific piece to guns, um, creating barriers to an impulsive act. You want um, the best strategy, of course, is to have them at least temporarily remove the weapons, any guns they have from the house. Now this can get tricky if they have pistols. I'm not sure what the rules are or what the laws are in Florida, but in New York State, um, you have to have a permit to be handling somebody's pistol. But that individual can go to a local gun store and drop it off and they can hold on to a gun. The police can also take a gun out of the house temporarily. Another strategy is to lock the guns in a gun cabinet and give the key or combination to others, especially during times of risk. Um, and again, this creates a barrier to an impulsive act. Placing gun locks on the guns and giving keys to someone else for safekeeping is another strategy. At the very least, get all the bullets out of the house. Keep your gun. If you feel for safety, it helps keep your gun. Get the bullets out. <clears throat> if they won't do that, lock the bullets up separately. Give somebody else a key. You get the idea. Try, try to create those barriers. This is an example of a tailored and meaning-based safety plan. I'm just going to touch on it briefly. Um, so the, the warning signs all the way on the left, one, two, three, feeling lonely and isolated, having an argument with my wife, when I think about my son who died in Iraq. So those are the, this individual's warning signs. <clears throat> and the refocusing activity is to write a poem to share. Uh, then if that's not working, go to a church event. And if that's not working, call, friend, call my friend George. The next part of it is, I will seek help from George when. 
I can't shake my loneliness and other steps didn't work. I will seek professional help. So when my feelings of loneliness lead to suicidal thoughts. So again, you see this is very, very instructive for someone who is moving towards a crisis. They don't have to do a lot of thinking because you and that individual spend a lot of time thinking ahead of time about the best ways to handle these particular uh, issues. So again, you see three of them listed here. Each of them, again, you might know it has its own plan. The other thing I like to do in a safety plan is to put their other helpful coping strategies in that you couldn't put in. Read a book, go fishing. Um, again, you see the meaning-based piece, go fishing with grandson. Um, <clears throat> coping strategies that have not worked, this is important. I know it doesn't work when I drink or punch things or keep feelings pent up or avoid conversations. So strengths, again, I should have a much longer list of strengths here. Uh, interests uh, and how you bring those together, what gives me a sense of meaning and purpose. And, uh, and then the contacts, you can see both the name and the phone number are listed. Uh, and then you have that step that it addresses what are the things that are greatest risk for me, gunshot to the head or jumping up a high bridge. My actions to be sure I don't uh, have access to these are, I've given my guns to my friend George, I'll stay away from bridges, I will call for help if I feel like going to a bridge or to jump or getting my guns back to hurt myself. So again, you see this very, very comprehensive and instructive safety plan. So we are coming up to the end here. Um, and this, we're going back to jo uh, John, and this is, again, where you're going to use your worksheet. John, age 78, lost his wife to MS. It was a long process of slow decline until, after a decade, she could no longer interact at all. And she passed two months ago. He grieves the loss of not only his wife, but of the last 10 years of his life, lost to providing her almost constant care. He is angry and he's lonely. He's fearing his own death is on the horizon. He has a bucket list of goals that he reports with regret have little chance of becoming accomplished. Over the past week, he started considering different methods of suicide. He fears that he will suffer pain with certain methods, so he decided to look into hanging himself and fashion a noose. While intoxicated, he tied the, the rope to a pipe jammed between two door jams, got on a chair with the noose around his neck, and nearly slipped off the chair. His plan was to see if it would work, but when he slipped and almost carried out the plan, he scared himself. He then reached out to the suicide professional suicide prevention hotline for support. And he was referred to you, Mary Kay. So, um, in keeping with the presented material, describe three treatment approaches or techniques that you would use uh, to address the specific needs of John under these circumstances. So I'll give you a minute to think about that and jot down an answer. I'm going to go back to the case in case you want to look at John again. So again, in keeping with the presented material, describe three treatment approaches or techniques that you would use to address the specific um, needs. No problem. Um, okay. And then the next question is to describe three specific benefits this particular client might enjoy as a result of the approach of the approach or techniques you described. So what are the benefits, uh, the effects, the positive, those positive effects of those things that you did? So that's question number two on your worksheet. Feel free to type anything in the chat box if you want to copy and paste it in there. Whatever, let the handwriting. So three specific benefits uh, as a result of the approach or techniques that you used, and. Then we're going to move on to the dialogue. Um, let me know if you're ready. I know 
there's a 10 second delay here. So. Okay, so this is the dialogue. Um, John says, my life has run its course. I have no meaning and purpose in life anymore. You, as the social worker, say yes, and you feel that suicide is the only option, right? And John replies, unfortunately, yes. Um, so the social worker says, I'd like you to consider the possibility that there may be a better option. Um, so then the question is, as the social worker providing this intervention, what is something you would say or ask next that is in keeping with the techniques and the approaches learned today, specific to this dialogue? So what is something that you would ask or say next in keeping with the techniques and approaches learned today? So Mary Kay, I um, am scheduled, I have a number of uh, pre-approved um, presentations, topics and presentations. Um, this is actually my fourth one. I did depression, uh, this should say suicide treatment. Uh, I, I did depression assessment and treatment. I did suicide risk assessment and suicide risk treatment. Um, but I don't have to do any particular topic next week. Is there something, if you're planning on coming back, since you're the only one coming, <laughs> you're funding this operation, for now anyway, if there's something that you want to do next, I'm more than happy to focus on that next week if you want. Um, so I would thinking about things like anxiety disorders, eating disorders. Um, I could do something potentially on seniors. I could do more on meaning and purpose if you want. Um, so if there's something specific that you want, I don't mind tailoring it to you for now because nobody else is coming, assuming that it'll also interest other people. So let me know. Uh, you can let me know by email if you want. Did you have any final questions or comments? Anxiety? Okay. We can deal with anxiety next. I, that might have been next on my list anyway. So I'll have one on anxiety you know, assessment, and then we'll do one on anxiety treatments. That's a great topic to talk about in this day and age for sure. Um, did I meet your learning goal? And I, I go back to the um, that combustion, the idea of the combustion. When all those pieces are in place, that's when you really want to do the safety plan. There's poor coping. Uh, especially if there's substance use there too, and um, subjective burdens are high, those vulnerabilities are there, uh, there's access to means potentially, and um, suicide is a real option. That's a big part of that too, um, when they're really seriously considering suicide as a way to, to handle their situation. So hopefully that did address your, uh, your, your um, learning goal. So again, you can just email the course evaluation form of the worksheet. It's very important to know as many patients who feel they have no meaning or purpose. Yes, yes, it was. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, well, I'll be back next week, same bad time, same bad station, and um, we'll focus on anxiety assessment. And don't feel obligated to go necessarily if you have other commitments. <laughs> I'm, hopeful, I'm hoping other people will eventually come. The first one I had like three, then I had two, but I had so many technology issues the first two, that was a problem. Um, so anyway, appreciate it, and um, have a good week. <laughs> Hopefully I'll see you next week. Thanks, Mary Kay.